Um, so it is with great pleasure uh, that I welcome you all to our eighth event uh, in our series of virtual leadership um, development sessions. Um, this morning as well to hear from Shalina Patel, uh, Head of Teaching and Learning and Head of History at Claremont High School Academy. Uh, and Shalina will be talking about her work uh, developing diversity within the curriculum. Um, to provide some context, uh, Claremont are an outstanding secondary school uh, and one of our hub lead schools in our Chrysalis Hub, which is based in Harrow, North London. Um, and Claremont are a fantastic school. We do lots of work for them. We're always asking them to help support us in a range of different ways. And they've always got um, yeah, a fantastic kind of array of um, content that they're, and projects that they're working on at the school. So uh, it's great that Shalina is here with us this morning. Um, and Shalina's excellent work in this field has been uh, recently picked up by the BBC. It's been picked up um, by news organisations around the world. And sorry to, um, and just to flag, I think uh, Shalina also won a Pearson Teaching Award in 2018, I believe, Shalina, maybe you can correct me. Um, yes, that's <laughs> so uh, you know really uh, highly regarded in this respect and um, yeah I'm incredibly pleased that Shaleen has uh, given up her time to be with us this morning um, and yeah whilst uh, lockdown has obviously been an incredibly kind of uh, stressful and anxious time for many um, it has provided some really positive opportunities to to pause and reflect and and consider um, a little, you know, those bigger picture questions about, you know, what we teach and, and why we teach it. Um, and I think everyone would agree, especially given the current climate, that our curriculum and, and you know, the texts and the references that we use, you know, should be updated, should be modernised, diversified to better reflect the, you know, the rich and complicated historical narrative of Britain, um, but also more representative of, you know, the multicultural and globalised society we we all have it. Um, before I hand over to Shalina, I'm just going to click through. Uh, just to run through some of the house rules for the presentation quickly. So please do mute yourself if you haven't already. I can see that um, the majority of you have. Uh, you can do that by if you hover over the Google chat function, there should be a kind of microphone sign on your bottom left. You can also mute and unmute your microphone by holding Control and D. Um, many of you have already been using the chat function to introduce yourselves, which is fantastic. Good morning to you all. Uh, if you haven't, please do um, pop something in that chat. Uh, the chat function uh, we will also be using to record any kind of questions, musings, thoughts as we go throughout the presentation. Uh, there will be some natural pauses um, to, to go back to those as well as chances for uh, Q&A at the end. So please do use that the, the post um, any thoughts as we go along and we will try and come back to those um, as and when. Uh, just to flag we are recording this session as well so please do keep swearing to a minimum um, and uh, that's so we can then share this presentation with any uh, delegates that weren't able to make it here this morning and, and uh, yeah, partners from across our network. Uh, lastly, we will be sending uh, a feedback form following uh, this presentation. Please do take the t uh, five minutes to fill that out. We do really value feedback and it does um, feed in as a practitioner-led organisation. Uh, that feedback does shape our programmes and our practice moving forward. So yeah, we'll be receiving that afterwards. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to hopefully pass over to Shalina. It should be seamless. Uh, he's going to present <laughs> her slides and uh, yeah, talk a little bit talk a little bit more about her uh, project diversifying uh, the curriculum. So Shalina, I'm going to stop presenting my slide Great. now. Okay, so in theory, in theory this is going to seamlessly work. Let's have a look. Um, okay, oh, oh no, one second. Not seamless, almost. <laughs> and there we go. Is that okay for everyone? That's Perfect. Okay, thank brilliant. Um, thank you, Aziz. So, morning, everyone. Um, just to say, I can't see myself uh, in, at the moment. I can only see my screen. So, apologies if I'm not looking directly um, at you all. Um, so, good morning. Happy Friday. I saw that in the chat. So, I totally agree with that. Happy Friday to everyone. Um, and yeah, as Aziz said, um, I work at Claremont High School and I am really, really passionate about diversity within the curriculum. Um, and just to say that this presentation, 
um, today is actually based on a presentation that I did last year um, within our uh, within our hub um, about diversity within the curriculum. So this isn't a kind of uh, all of the stuff that I'm talking about has obviously been updated um, in the current climate, but it is something that uh, has sort of happened at, at Claremont and within our hub for a while. Um, so before we start, obviously, um, the, the big sort of word that we're talking about today is diversity, diversity within the curriculum. We'll be covering uh, intersectionality, decolonization and other words like that as well. Um, but I just wanted to start off by saying, of course, when we're talking about diversity, diversity means so many different things, of course. Um, and today I will be focusing on uh, race, uh, race and ethnicity and gender as well, but I will be touching on um, some of the other areas. And of course, when I'm talking about things, let's say, related to race specifically, of course, they, that can be applied uh, to lots of other types of diversity as well. Um, so I will, <laughs> I hate this slide, I find it really awkward, um, but my head teacher insisted that I put this in there. Uh, luckily, Aziz has had a lot of this already. So um, I did win a Pearson Teaching Award in 2018. And I think a big reason for that was because of my work to do with diversity in the curriculum. Um, as Aziz said as well, the BBC, uh, which was very uh, difficult, the BBC wanted to come to our school during uh, during quarantine to uh, talk to myself and some of our students about how we approach teaching black history and the fact that we don't just, uh, you know, we don't just teach black history during Black History Month, but it is embedded uh, throughout our curriculum uh, from year seven all the way through to year 13, which I will be talking about today. Um, I've written about uh, various things to do with diversity as well. I know we had a question that came through um, when you guys were applying to come to this presentation about uh, women in the curriculum, girls. Um, so I have written an article about that, which is in the resource list. Um, and I'll talk about the history corridor um, later on. So um, I know lots of you have seen, obviously, the agenda for today. I will be checking the time uh, to check that I am uh, not running over. Um, but there is some time built in at the end. Um, for questions and if we we might go into that time um, so yeah we will uh, what I will be doing is pausing uh, after kind of each agenda item um, for any questions um, but like as he said there is kind of going to be an opportunity right at the end um, to ask any questions um, etc um, so before we make a start um, I just wanted to say that what I find quite useful sometimes during uh, presentations like this is uh, to kind of write notes down through PPF, so through past, present and future. That's something that I've stolen from the uh, Alivi Outstanding Teacher Programme. And the reason why I wanted to mention that is because as teachers, we can be really, really hard on ourselves, um, especially when it comes when it comes to things like this, where we think, oh, we're not doing anything right and we need to change all of these things. But what I quite like about PPF is this idea that actually, you know, in your schools, there will, of course, have been so much work already to do with diversity and will be happening now in the present too. Um, so I wanted to kind of have that as, you know, if you wanted to write notes through that lens, I find it quite helpful in terms of remembering that there is a lot of great work that will have been happening in your schools already. Um, and then writing things down uh, that you might want to uh, take up from the things that I've said in, in the kind of future um, section. Um, and before I start as well, hopefully, um, you know that there is, uh, you've either already received it or will be at the end of this presentation. Um, I've created a resource booklet I suppose it kind of turned into a bit of a monster it's it's quite it's many many pages but hopefully I have uh, put all the resources and links and there's so much reading and uh, resources that I've put on that list um, so that you can uh, really delve into um, these issues in more detail because of course I've only got an hour to talk about things that I could talk for many many hours on um, so yeah there's there there will be a resource list that will be available to all of you as well and hopefully you find that useful um, OK, so the first thing um, that I'll be covering today is what the research tells us. Now, um, originally, actually, I had uh, called this what the limited research tells us, um, because there isn't necessarily a huge amount of research happening in terms Well, there hasn't been previously, but there is more and more research um, coming out now and um, people writing things about diversity in the curriculum, which is amazing. Um, so the first place I wanted to start uh, was to talk about uh, briefly about the research that SOAS have done. Um, now, obviously, SOAS um, are a university um, and obviously a lot of all the research that they've done is relevant to higher education. But what I would say is, is so much of their research can be adapted and is relevant um, for us as teachers, whether that is in uh, primary or secondary school. Um, if I was doing this uh, presentation live to you kind of in a, you know, in a in a hall or whatever, I'd be giving you uh, 
um, pages eight to 10 um, of this research and asking you to look at the questions um, that they have in there. Um, what's really great about this research is they have curriculum questions um, that are really, really useful, I think, um, to have those conversations with heads of department, with key stage coordinators, etc. Um, and they have questions like questioning about the content presuming a particular orientation, um, the demographic profile of authors, which I know is something that lots of you have shared um, shared some concerns about. Um, it's got suggested adaptations as well um, in there. So I'd really recommend um, going through those questions in particular um, on pages eight to 10. They're really, really helpful. Could be great as a discussion for a curriculum meeting, for example. Um, and I think we can all agree with something that it says in the SOAS um, research. It says the ultimate goal is about finding a way to make the educational environment as equal and just as possible, as well as making it livable, welcoming and supportive. Um, and I think that is a great quote to potentially share with staff if they are a bit sceptical about using kind of university research. Um, that's something that's, you know, related to higher education. I think it's a really great um, resource that we can certainly use. And they, SOAS, would def have definitely sort of led the way in the UK anyway, in terms of decolonizing um, the higher education curriculum. So I'd really recommend looking through that. Of course, it is in the resource list. Um, another great piece of research um, from 2018 was this one, um, the key drivers of the disadvantage gap. Um, it's not very long at all, and it's re I really would uh, recommend reading it. And the bit that I wanted to focus on here um, are, this, are the bits are the quotes here where it says, findings from experimental studies suggest a sense of belonging is one of the most important determinants of whether an individual decides to enter, continue or abandon a pursuit. And I just love the way that it's that it's frames that as a sense of belonging. And I think that is something that's really that I'm really, really passionate about this idea that do all of our students feel a sense of belonging um, through their learning? Um, and it's I think it's, it's really interesting to think about. And I and I also really like the terminology that they use here about role model visibility um, and Obviously, this is talking about uh, disadvantaged students. And of course, it's applicable to when we're talking about diversity in the curriculum. So my key question, really, um, if you were to go through this uh, research is how can you kind of up the role model visibility in your setting? Um, and I know, as he said at the beginning, which I completely agree with about this idea that, you know, we have to make sure that our school is representative of the 21st century and that we're preparing the students for that. I think role model visibility is a great um, is a great sort of thing to consider. Um, again, if you're sharing this um, with staff, a uh, couple of other bits of research at uh, this one here from uh, from Lambeth It is the achievement of black Caribbean pupils and it talks a lot about um, cultural development. Um, it talks about a lot of things that I'll be touching on today um, in terms of celebrating uh, cultural diversity, um, in terms of, you know, displays and things like that. So I'll be touching on quite a few of these things. Um, and I think the key question here. Uh, is to reflect on is to what extent is diversity celebrated in a dynamic way in your setting and I purposely said have said dynamic because I think again it's about you know I know that uh, of course I know that in schools there is such a time pressure who knows what September is going to look like um, but I think of course we do have a tendency to maybe maybe continue doing things the same way every and that's why I wanted to add the word dynamic there um, to think about you know what what do you do uh, currently to celebrate uh, diversity and actually how can that be what does plus one look like I suppose what could you do that's even better than that um, this research I'm not sure how many of you are familiar with the female lead um, if you're not familiar with them then I would really really encourage you to have a look at their website which is amazing um, and also they actually have a book which is incredible which is in my classroom which I don't have with me at the moment uh, but they have a book that they can send you for free they send to schools in America and the UK for free and it is full of the most inspirational women um, that cover all kinds of uh, all kinds of different subject areas and they are a fantastic organization and they've uh, they released a, a piece of research last year um, that was about the, the link between the mental health of teenage girls and what they see on their phones, on their timeline. Um, and even though it wasn't necessarily directly related to school, the way, the reason why I wanted to bring this up is because I think it links to role model visibility. Um, and I think it's the idea of that key question, who are the female role models in your, um, in, in your school that your female students come across in there, in your setting? What stories of inspirational women do you, do, does your school tell through its various subjects that resonate with all students? Um, and again, yeah, something to think about. I will be talking more about the female lead 
um, later on when it comes to extracurricular activities as well. Um, so yeah, I'd really recommend um, reading this piece of research and definitely please go on the Female Lead website. Um, they are really, really fantastic and order the book as well. Um, and the final piece of research, which is the most recent piece of research, which only came out in the last few weeks um, from the brilliant um, Runnymede organisation. Uh, they do absolutely fantastic work. I've had the privilege to go to lots of their events before um, and they have in the last few weeks released uh, this um, piece of research called Race and Racism in English Secondary Schools. Um, and it is about secondary schools, but all those primary teachers that are here, um, of course, what they're saying is a lot of it is is directly transferable to primary. Um, and I will be touching on a lot of their research throughout this presentation. Um, I know we had a lot of questions about racial literacy. Um, I will be talking you through some ways that you could try, um, that you could try to kind of up the racial literacy in your school through CPD, which I'll talk about later on. Um, but this research is brilliant. Um, it talks about so many things. It talks about school policies. It talks about the role the police have in your school. It talks about the curriculum. It talks about recruitment as well. I know we had a couple of questions um, as well about teacher recruitment. Um, my this presentation is mostly going to be about the kind of curriculum cpd etc but i would really recommend reading this report um for um some insight into what they suggest about um yeah about uh, the teacher workforce um but I was, i'll just read out that last uh, that last pa um point where it says accordingly curricula needs overhauling to increase racial diversity and to center anti-racism um i know that that echoes what aziz said earlier and i could see the faces that i could see on the bottom of the screen i could see you all nodding as well so i know that this is something that you know, everyone who's in this presentation agrees with, and hopefully you can take away some ideas of how you can uh, start on that journey. Um, so I know a key question you all already have is how can you raise the racial literacy levels of all your staff at all levels? And I will be going through that um, in theory at around 10.35, um, hopefully. Um, so before we move on to the next part, um, this is something that I had in my previous presentation um, that I wanted to put in here because we all know that there are naysayers. We all know that there are people in school who possibly will say things like this. Um, I've certainly have had conversations similar to it's really hard to find diverse examples for science, which I don't think is true. Um, and the resource list deliberately I have uh, divided you know, the, the, some of the sections by subject uh, to give you some resources that you can use as a springboard. But there are so many uh, resources out there if you know where to find them. I have tried to share as many as possible with you. Um, the dark blue one, we haven't got time for this. There's too much content to get through. Obviously, in the kind of this sort of new normal that we have, I totally get that it's there's such a constraint on time, um, especially because we don't even know if we can have students in our classroom in the same way anymore. Um, but I do think that, um, you know, given the current climate, but also just because it's our duty as 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 teachers to you know fully prepare our students for the real world. Um, and so I think that should be the argument uh, that is used uh, if people say uh, something similar to what it says in the dark blue bubble there. Um, so before we move on to the curriculum, um, I just wanted to ask if has anyone got any questions so far, um, or otherwise I can continue. Aziz, what do you suggest? Uh, no, no questions so far, Shalina. Okay. Um, so it might be good to crack on and then I'm okay, sure brilliant. things might pop through as, as and when we go. Yeah. Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you. Okay, so of course the obvious starting point uh, when we're thinking about diversity in the curriculum is of course the curriculum itself. Um, and so I wanted to start by talking about what decolonizing the curriculum actually means because I'm sure um, lots of you have seen uh, this sort of terminology being used increasingly um, in the media in sort of you know in uh, in educational sort of magazines and supplements and things like that um, and so I suppose the reason why I wanted to start here is a so that we're all kind of on the same page about this but also remembering I suppose that this is my interpretation of what decolonizing the curriculum is um, but also I think uh, if you are going to kind of embark on this journey I think it's really really important to make it really clear that you understand what decolonizing the curriculum is and also make and also then you're also able to make sure that your staff really understand what it means because there are lots of uh, there's lots of different um, thoughts out there I've, I've seen actually a couple of times more from American authors that, that they don't like the term decolonizing actually um, so there is a lot of debate out there I will be using that terminology um, throughout this presentation but again it is up to you to decide whether that is the terminology that you want to use um, so I think the first place you have to start 
if you are talking to staff about decolonizing the curriculum is to make it really, really clear that decolonizing the curriculum is not about abolishing the canon. Um, it's about reflecting, reflecting on what the subject matter is and how it's being taught. And I think um, this idea of not abolishing the canon is really, really clear in everything that I have uh, that I've kind of been reading about this. Um, and it's really clear in the SOAS um, in the SOAS research as well. So um, I think starting there and sort of reassuring people that you know that this is not about kind of deleting every single lesson that you've ever taught and starting again because that is you know impossible but it is about reflecting really critically um like i said on what the subject matter is and how it's being taught and this will mean that some things need to be cut because they are not appropriate anymore or that actually you need to cut some things to make space for other stories other voices um, and i know that can be sometimes com feel really difficult, especially for, you know, that the, that particular lesson or that particular series of lessons, for example, someone has obviously taken a huge amount of time to create those, but it's really, really important. That's why it's really important, I think, to make it really clear why you are decolonizing the curriculum and what that actually means, making that clear to your staff when you're starting this journey, rather than kind of dictating, this is what we're going to do, kind of making that, uh, making that clear. Um, of course, as Aziz said, I am a history teacher, so I will be talking about the history curriculum, but I will also be broadening it out as well. Um, so I've said here, for example, reflecting on the British history um, that's being taught in your school, what perspective um, is being offered? What lens is this history being taught through? Um, are the contributions and achievements of those from, uh, this is an example, are the uh, contributions and achievements of those from the Commonwealth part of this perspective? Are they hidden or completely invisible? Um, the reason why I've mentioned uh, the contributions of the Commonwealth in particular um, is because every single school, when you teach key social history, you will all teach World War One and World War Two, for example. Um, unfortunately, the, a lot of the textbooks um, for World War One and World War Two for key social they may cover a tiny bit, but they don't really emphasize, I don't think, the massive role that the Commonwealth played, for example. Um, you know, Indian soldiers, soldiers from Africa, from the Caribbean, etc., and the women as well who contributed from those places. Um, I don't think that those that their role is emphasised nearly enough, um, and so I think that is why I've mentioned that in particular. Um, traditionally, and I think we have to be honest about this. Traditionally, the teaching of school history has led to the othering of non-British and non-white perspectives, um, and I would say even you know, and that I would say that that relates to women as well as well as other groups. Um, but if we're talking about race, the use of the term whitewash works here. Um, and I think you only have to look at the media coverage of VE Day to see that. Um, I will talk more about VE Day um, later on when I, I talk about assemblies. Um, but I think that the reason why I wanted to put that there is because if you think back to what you were watching on VE Day, you will, pr I, I had it on all day uh, at home and I didn't once see anything mentioned about Indian soldiers, about um, soldiers from various parts of Africa, from the Caribbean, despite their massive, the massive contribution that they made, particularly considering that a lot of these soldiers continued fighting after VE Day um, in bigger numbers than kind of British soldiers did. Um, and it wasn't something that was really mentioned at all. And I think that's it's really important for us to remember that the country <laughs> still has a lot of catching up to do in terms of making you know in terms of providing uh in, in terms of providing kind of you know balanced perspectives and i think my dream in a way came sort of came true actually during uh, v day which is my dream has always been for my students to watch coverage like v day and to think hang on this is not this is not what Miss Patel taught us. This is not what we learn in history. Um, and that is exactly what happened. I received messages on Teams. If anyone uses Microsoft Teams with their, with their school, you'll know that they can just chat to you, can't they? And I received so many chat messages from students just saying, Miss, I've been I've watched the news and no one's mentioned, you know, the two and a half million Indian soldiers, or no one's mentioned, you know, the the women from the Caribbean who worked in the ATS. And I think that's exactly that proves, I suppose, that what we're doing is working, is that the students are being critical. They're watching this on the news and they are they're thinking for themselves. Um, and I've read a lot about wanting to empower students to be critical thinkers. And I think that's a great example to show that actually they if you do kind of embark on this journey, they they will become those critical thinkers. And it's really it's really amazing, I think. Um, OK, so now. This next bit is something that I've not really seen much written about, and this was not in my previous um, this was not in my previous uh, presentation. Um, but okay, I've been reading a lot about how how much time students have been spending on their phones, even more so than normal, of course, because of uh, because of uh, you know being in quarantine and things like that. Um, and I think there is a link here with decolonizing the curriculum because. 
um, I think exposing students to a wider range of perspectives is necessary because the students that we teach now are very different to the students that we taught a decade ago, for example, because of the access that they have to the internet in, in a way that I think hasn't we haven't really seen before and i'll explain a little bit more about that um we hear a lot about people about adults having their own echo chamber right and we especially if we think about um you know if we think about things like the lead up to brexit and things like that there was lots uh, lots there's obviously been lots of research gone into you know um what what people who voted a certain way were seeing on their social media feed and that echo chamber then uh, you know directly influencing who what they who they you know what uh, they decided to vote for in that referendum the same can be said for students and i think i haven't really seen a lot about this and i think we have to be aware that students now they've got their own echo chamber as well in a way that i don't think we've ever seen before um and the examples that i will give is the fact that the fact that for example the the murder of george floyd um the video that awful video of amy cooper that uh, the the american lady in central park i saw those videos and my students saw those videos on social media way before they were being picked up by mainstream news um and i wanted to make that point because i think we have to kind of understand that online our students are you know are seeing lots of things that actually mainstream news maybe isn't covering until and for a few you know till a few kind of till a few days later um and i think it links to decolonizing the curriculum because i think our students are really really empowered um by this by social media and i know that there are there are so many negatives to do with social media but i think we do have to kind of i suppose acknowledge the fact that social media is being used for activism in a way that i've certainly not seen um, in the last few years, in quite in quite the way that it's happened in the last few months, anyway, um, and I think that, that there's a link there. I think between the fact that we have to bridge that gap between what is potentially an outdated and maybe harmful curriculum, which I'll talk about later, um, and balance that with the fact that our students have got free access. They've got free access to information, different perspectives. Um, and I'll add another point, which is that, um, and I know this from speaking to my own students, we were lucky enough, I've been lucky enough to be able to speak to a lot of my form and uh, via Teams, for example, and I've asked them, um, you know, what are you seeing? How, you know, how are you? What are you seeing on your social media? Are you taking a break from it, et cetera? And they've all said, you know, that their timelines that, as we can see here, the average Gen, Gen Z, as we would say, spends almost 11 hours online each day. Um, you know, they are seeing throughout those 11 hours, say, they are seeing you know so much about um, activism about black lives matter about all of these things that that again the mainstream media is not talking about as much anymore but that's not what our students are seeing um, so i think it's really important for us to acknowledge that um, and to think what can we do to make sure that we empower them so that they are again so that they're, they're critical thinkers so that they can see things on their social media and potentially question some things sometimes uh, to be able to make that distinction between what is true and what isn't um and yeah so i think that's something uh, important to consider um as well i'm just checking the checking the time right gotta be quick um okay so in terms of uh, missed opportunities within your formal curriculum i think that's the obvious place to start and i know i had a couple of questions about what has my journey been in terms of uh, the history of curriculum at claremont so i just wanted to quickly run you through that so we're going to start with key stage four and five um and if you look at what we offer at claremont we have deliberately picked um modules that offer differing perspectives and they have been tough choices. You know, we did not know a huge amount about the age of the Crusades, I admit, uh, when the A-level changed a few years ago, but we opted to, uh, to, to teach it because we wanted to offer that differing uh, perspective to our students. Um, we also teach the Making of Modern Britain, um, we, we follow AQA, which covers, and we, the reason why we wanted to, uh, use, uh, to teach that module is because it covers in every decade, the rights of women, ethnic minorities, um, what the working classes and also the LGBTQ plus community as well. Um, so we have chosen those modules because of the fact that they offer our students um, an insight into different types of people. And that is the reason why. Um, I'm not sure if as you said, but um, Claremont is 90 percent BAME. Uh, our students are 90 um, Yeah, 90 percent of them are uh, they're mostly um, Black Caribbean students as well as um, students of Indian origin. Um, and so we wanted to make sure that our students saw themselves um in their in the a-level curriculum and i do think this relates to the fact that i'm very proud of the fact that we have steadily had um ethnic minority students successfully applying to oxbridge to do history um you know uh, successfully for several years now and i think one of the reasons for that is because we teach a 
diverse curriculum um, at A level and of course also at GCSE. So GCSE, of, co of course, we're held to whatever the exam board um, offers you, but we decided to teach the Elizabethans because we wanted um, them to learn about um, a female leader and there's lots of things in there about religious tolerance, etc. as well. Um, we teach the Korean and Vietnam War, which not many schools do. Um, but again, um, we wanted to give our students that different perspective. And we also teach um, Power and the People as well, which is a module that covers um, the struggles of various people uh, to gain uh, not only suffrage, but also um, power in general. So it covers women, working classes, um, the ethnic minorities as well. The final, um, the final story in Power and the People is the murder of Stephen Lawrence, actually. Um, so it's really, it's a really, really powerful um, GCSE module um, that the students get a lot, get a huge amount out of. Um, something to think about as well is, is there any freedom within your exam offer? So for example, uh, in history with AQA, there is a coursework module, for example. Um, so our two coursework options, again, offer that diverse perspective. So we cover Indian independence, um, and we so there's that's one question the students can do, but students can also do a question about British working class reform as well. So again, hopefully you can see there that our key stage four and five offer. Yes, the, you know it's not it's the we have to choose from whatever the exam board have given us, but we have chosen those modules not because we knew a huge amount about them. Certainly, I I did not know a huge amount about the Crusades at all, but I've now successfully taught it um, for three or four years now. Um, and yeah, if you have if you do have the freedom to choose what are you choosing and why, I suppose. And then of course there's Key Stage 3. Um, and I'll talk a bit more about Key Stage 3 next. So I suppose the first thing to say is we teach areas of, uh, of history in Key Stage 3 that are certainly not covered by the textbooks. And I think that is a big problem um, that I have yet to find uh, a good textbook that covers any of the, the things that we cover in, uh, that's in, you know, in the right amount of detail in ways that is not problematic, which I'll talk about later as well. Um, and like this was not the case when I first joined the school. Um, we barely touched on the suffragettes, let alone <laughs> lots of other things. So I think um, it's been a journey and it's been a long journey. This is not something you can turn around in a year. It's probably a three year process, I would say, and constantly um, reflecting as well. But we have managed to embed diversity within our key stage three curriculum over the last few years. Um, so we teach, for example, uh, Mughal India, African Kingdom. This is just a few things. Um, colonial soldiers, feminism and equality today. Um, lots of individuals, which I'll, which I'll talk about later. Um, and I've written their year nine exam question, which showcases this. And the reason why I've said that is because uh, in our year nine, end of year, year nine exam, we ask the students a question, which is of all the people you've learned about, uh, at Claremont in Key Stage 3 in history, who would you suggest there should be a statue of in Parliament Square? Which is so funny because, of course, that is really topical. But we've asked that question for a few years. And it brings me so much joy that across those 270 answers that we get, the answers are so diverse. Um, the people that they suggest from the vast people that we have taught them about in the last three years, they come up with, they come up with, you know, Sophia Dalip Singh, for example, or... Alan Turing, and they don't come up with the answers that you might expect Key Stage 3 students to come up with because of the fact that they've learned about so many different types of people. So um, that's a quick sort of tour of the uh, of the history curriculum at Claremont. I think the main thing is, is that we have, we choose the things that we choose because we want our students to see themselves in the curriculum, but also we want them, if they are leaving us at the end of Key Stage 3, for example, um, we want them to have had a really, to have a really rich understanding um, of British history, because this is British history, right? Um, and so I think that's, it's, that's kind of really, really important to consider. Um, I did want to talk about um, teaching the slave trade because it's something that has been uh, talked about a lot in uh, in the media. And this wasn't something I had in my original presentation. So uh, very quickly, for those of you that, that don't teach history and don't know, Key Stage 3 textbooks frame the slave trade like this. Uh, the Triangle of Trade, the Middle Passage and a Plantation Life in America. And I've written Roots there because anyone that teaches history uh, knows that Roots is often used um, as a way in for students. Um, and it then it might talk about the British abolition movement and then it moves on to the American Civil War and American Civil Rights. So students start with understanding that the slave, slave trade uh, in, within a British context, but then the story ends with American Civil Rights, which then means that they will potentially leave Key Stage 3 framing the slave trade in an American context rather than in a British context. So 
the way that we teach this at Claremont, um, which is partly why the BBC came uh, to our school, is that we make sure that we're teaching, um, we teach black presence in Britain before the slave trade. Um, I have here, <laughs> just a plug for David Olasoga, I have um, Black and British, as you can see from the tabs. Um, I am quite a nerd when I, read, when I re was reading that book and it is so brilliant um, for showcasing Black, black presence in Britain, um, you know, throughout uh, throughout history. And I think it's really, really important that students understand that there has been black presence in Britain for a for centuries, uh, starting with, of course, um, Iv uh, the Ivory Bangle Lady, for example, and moving on from there. Um, we also teach African kingdoms, uh, so Songhay, Mansa Musa, et cetera. We teach African kingdoms before we teach uh, the Triangle of Trade because we want students to understand um, you know, West African civilizations before, um, before you know, the Triangle of Trade. Um, when, we, when we teach them plantation life, we teach them plantation life in, within a Jamaican context, because again, we want to make sure that they are understanding plantation life from within a British slave trade perspective rather than, uh, rather than American. Um, and the American Civil Rights Movement is always in Key Stage 3 textbooks. I have not yet found a Key Stage 3 textbook that talks about the British Civil Rights Movement, um, which I'll talk about again um, shortly. But again, I think it's really important that our students understand that um, there was a British Civil Rights Movement in this country um, and that they, it's important for them to understand that. Um, Oh, as I said, is it, is it any wonder that students have misunderstood Britain's role in the slave trade it, based on what the Key Stage 3 textbooks, kind of how they frame um, the slave trade? So I won't go through um, all of these questions. So I'm conscious that we are, uh, that I'm going to run out of time. Um, but I think it's, these are some questions anyway that I think you could speak to, you know, if your history teacher's here and heads of history here, then uh, reflecting on these. But if you are, if you have a, if you have a different role in school, then I think having this conversation with your history department is really, really, really important. So, for example, let's pick up that third one: Is the beginning of empire framed as exploring and settling in new countries? Because it wasn't exploring. Um, that's erasing the reality of indigenous people, um, and it's reducing these nations to the sum of their parts as resources. It wasn't exploring; it was exploiting. I would say. Um, so I think that's really, really important to think about. That. You know, we frame this as this kind of, you know, uh, Elizabethan exploration. Uh, it wasn't. Um, it was much more sinister than that. And I think it's important for us to for us to make sure that's clear to our students. Um, oh, if I go to the third one from the bottom, is the empire framed as good versus bad? Um, this notion that somehow the British bringing railways to. So I know I'm ranting now. If you know the British bringing railways to India, somehow that balances decades of violent oppression and massacres. Um, you can't teach the British Raj without these uncomfortable truths. If you're teaching Indian independence and your lessons are just about Gandhi, that is not the real story. Um, so I think thinking about that, um, scrutinizing the resources. I know Aziz did sort of mention this earlier, that you know, we scrutinize, we have work scrutinies, don't we? We scrutinize pupil work, but are we doing the same for the resources that we have? Are, some resources are incredibly outdated and problematic, but also even really recent um, textbooks like this as well. If anyone knows about the Key Stage 3 Hodder textbook that was taken out of uh, circulation because of some of the really problematic things that it had in there. And that was only, I think, earlier this year. Um, you know, I've seen textbooks where in arguments about uh, to and pro and for and against the empire, I've seen a textbook that says, you know, for the empire, some people in England got very rich, exclamation mark. And you think, you know, we need to do better. We need to do better than this. Um, so I think, yeah, thinking about that sort of balance argument about the empire, I think is something we need to think about. And also other intersections as well. Where do women feature in your curriculum? Because I tell you, the story of women in Britain should not just start and end with the suffragettes. Um, and I think if, if you would have that conversation with your history departments, where do women feature? Because I think uh, it's important to think about. Um, I know, for example, uh, I guess here's the point to say, there is so much history that is being written. Uh, women are being written into British history uh, so much more now than they were before. If anyone's familiar with The Five by Hallie Rubenhold, um, we don't teach uh, Jack the Ripper in our school, but if you do, I would recommend reading The Five by Hallie Rubenhold and then making a lesson about those women, about the women that were killed by Jack the Ripper rather than the story being about him, kind of redress that balance. Um, so yeah, those are some ideas um, for questions that you could be thinking about when critically considering um, your history curriculum. And here's an, here's an example. So many students will leave Key Stage 3 knowing about, of course, uh, the March on Washington, but do they know about the Bristol bus boycott, for example? Um, potentially not. And so why is that? Why do they know about this? 
but they don't know about this um, in the same year. So kind of redressing that balance, I think. And that's about perspective, isn't it? We often we teach civil rights through an American lens, but actually we need to be spotlighting on what was happening in Britain as well. So we teach we teach it parallel. So we have a few lessons on the American civil rights movement and then we have a few lessons on the British uh, civil rights movement, which includes the Black Pan British Black Panther movement, um, includes the Mangrove Nine trial, for example. Um, it includes the rise of the National Front as well um, and various other various other things. So these are just a couple of slides about the Bristol bus boycott, which you can read uh, in your own time. Um, and I wanted to flag this book this book's only been out uh for a month or so um there's, there's a few other books in the series but this book there's a chapter on cultural capital um which is really 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 fantastic and i was going to read a bit to you but i won't but i would really recommend buying this book if you haven't already it's got some really brilliant it's not very long as well i'll show you it's really it's really small uh, so it won't take you very long to read but it is fantastic and like i said the chapter on cap cultural capital would be a great one potentially to photocopy for your staff because it talks about this idea, like I've been saying about, you know, it's not about abolishing the canon, it's about making space um, for those other stories. Um, so I think that's something, um, I think that's something really, really important to consider. Um, and actually, I think I should mention at this point, I did have a few questions about the Key Stage 3, uh, about the Key Stage 3 national curriculum, um, and how you can kind of diversify the parameters um within that and i think it's, i think and i actually so i work in an academy so i don't need to look at the curriculum but i did uh, because i saw that question and i found it really really interesting that um there is so much scope within the key century national curriculum to teach um diverse histories um for example i've got some quotes here that the national curriculum says how uh, you know to teach how britain has influenced and been influenced by the wider world um, knowing and understanding significant aspects of the history of the wider world. Um, and what we have to remember, I suppose, is that within all the chrono chronological uh, points that it mentions in the national curriculum, none of them are statutory except for the Holocaust, of course. So there is no reason why um, space can't be made when you are, for example, teaching about medieval Britain uh, to talk about, um, you know, to talk about black presence within that particular period of time. You know, when you're talking about... Um, you know, uh, the Elizabethan uh, age, for example, talking about that that was the start of the East India Company, which of course then leads to the leads onto the Raj. Um, so I think there's there's lots of scope in there, and I think one bit that I thought was quite funny actually was that in the curriculum, it said, in the national curriculum, it says um, characteristic features of past non-European societies, achievements and follies of mankind. Now, if the British Empire is, is not a folly of mankind, I don't know what it is. So there's scope there, definitely um, to. Uh, and I think what I suppose the key thing is don't be don't be sort of ring fenced by the textbooks because te the textbooks that I have seen certainly do not provide uh, diverse stories. Um, so I think it's about reflecting on what do you teach already and what voices could you bring in uh, to that story? Um, like I was saying about World War One and World War Two, for example. Um, and yeah, so I think that's so I think that was something that I wanted to something I wanted to flag up as well. Um, I think the key thing is this, don't don't bolt on, but aim to blend. Um, and so when we're thinking about non-white presence in Britain, um, there is there are so, so many examples. I've picked a few of my favourites here, um, but there are so many places where when you're teaching the Tudors, talk, uh, you know, talk about John Blank, Henry VIII's black trumpeter, who he bought a wedding present for, for example. Uh, when you're talking about the abolition of slavery, put Alado Equiano at the forefront of that, of that story. Um, when we're, you know, talking about World War II, thinking about Nora Nayat Khan and the, you know, and the sacrifices that she made. Um, on the screen, you can see there an Instagram account called The History Corridor, which is an account that I run. It's, an, it's anonymous, but it is me that runs it in my department. Um, and I'd recommend going on there just because we showcase uh, some of the things that we teach at Claremont. And so it's a great way for teachers, I think, to be able to be in, kind of be inspired. Um, it's not for students. Um, it's very much for adults um, to kind of learn uh, to relearn some school history, but I'd recommend for potentially for your history teachers if they're interested to go and have a look um, because there's lots and lots of stories um, that we share on there um, for ideas for what you can teach in your curriculum. Um, I won't talk about this actually because I know that I'm running out of uh, running out of time very rapidly. So I did want to talk about some of these questions here. Ooh, there we go. Um, so if we're thinking about broadening out these questions to other subjects, um, thinking about, for example, what texts are being used in English how are marginalised groups presented and by whom? Um, so the reason why I, want, why, why I frame the question like that is because I've had really interesting conversations with my English department about, about this. And for example, one of the changes that, they, that they've made is that they used to teach the help 
And now they teach the colour purple instead because the help is told, it, it, it covers a similar period of time, but the help is told from a white perspective, whereas the colour purple is told from an African-American perspective. So they've kind of made that decision on that basis. Um, in terms of English, there is in the resource list, there is a fantastic um, Instagram account called um, underscore the right writing underscore. And they have brilliant suggestions for writers, for poems, for poets rather, um, for people that they um, have. They've got lots of suggestions basically for diverse uh, voices that should be incorporated within the English curriculum. So I would that's run by an English teacher in North London called Jessica. So I'd really recommend um, looking at her work because she's got some fantastic resources. Um, what plays are being studied in drama? Um, Queens of Sheba I've got in there um, in brackets because it was a play that I saw some of my form perform for their GCSE drama. And it's all about misogynoir. So it's all about that kind of intersection between uh, misogyny and uh, kind of the, the sort of misogyny and, and racism that, um, that black women face. And it was so powerful to watch some of my students perform uh, sections from that uh, from that play. Um, so I'd really recommend uh, I'd really recommend that um, as something to look into. Um, lots of other questions, of course, as well. What music is being applauded? What artists and innovators are being showcased, etc. Um, there are so many questions uh, that you can ask your departments to reflect on when it comes to uh, reflecting on their on their curriculum, I suppose. Um, now, in the resource pack there, I have given you all a breakdown of different subjects and some resources that you can use to start uh, finding these um, stories. So this is in the resource list. It's something that I've just made myself and it's built up uh, for the past kind of uh, year, I suppose. Um, so it's just a starting point, but I have tried to cover most mainstream subjects. Um, and there's, you know, lots and lots of things in there that um, departments and teachers can get their teeth into. Um, and what I will say is I've, I've presented this to staff in my school and it sparks and what you'll find is if you do this in your school, it will spark conversation. So, for example, um, I had a com really brilliant conversation with the head of DT who said to me, look, I want to inspire more girls to pursue DT. Can you can you help me? Um, and so I found um, these. These are just three examples of some brilliant uh, women who are kind of innovators in uh, in design. Uh, currently, those are their Instagram accounts that I showed him and he's now made a display of their work, for example. So there are lots of resources out there. And I'm a big fan of using uh, of using Instagram, for example, as a way to find this kind of work. So that's just a, an example. Um, and one way that I would suggest that you could do this in your school is using the list that I've got in the resource in the resource pack of all the different subjects, sending that uh, list out to staff and giving them challenging them. So giving them six minutes, let's say, and I did this when I did this, uh, when I did this uh, training last time, um, challenging your staff to find something from one of those accounts that inspire, that would inspire or enthuse their students. And the reason why I'm saying to give them about six minutes is the point I'm trying to make is that you can find inspirational stories relating to your subject area really quickly, um, actually, if you know where to look. Um, and so that is a suggested activity um, for if you wanted to do something along those lines. Um, and again, you know, you can, I saw these changes happening, um, happening very quickly. So here's just a couple of examples of some homework tasks, for example, that, um, that I was sent by uh, the German department and the science department as well. Um, and I will also say actually that something else that we, that I, that we did was, um, as part of the CP, as part of CPD, I actually taught a history lesson, um, in a carousel <laughs> to all staff. Um, from SLT um, all the way down um, to show them, I suppose, just to sort of to immerse them in the experience of learning diverse history. Um, and it was a lesson that I taught on Noor in Eyal Khan. And I think that was really, really powerful for teachers to experience for themselves. Uh, this was a couple of years ago now, uh, for it to, you know, to experience for themselves what it's like to be in a lesson where you are talking about um, diverse history. And that certainly had a real impact, I know, on staff leading to things like this. Uh, so I'm conscious that I've been talking for a very long time and also um, the timing is totally out of whack now. Um, Aziz, are there any questions that anyone wants to share? <laughs> Thank you, Shalina. No, it's been brilliant and it's really, um, yeah, really interesting and thought provoking points. Um, I'd just like to go back to you mentioned about uh, you know the textbooks and maybe they're yeah. not being the resources available mm. at like Key Stage Three, and I, I just wanted to maybe touch on the point of funding in mm. regards to this. I know that you know as you mentioned there are kind of a lot of out out of date resources in terms mm. of your experience of doing this. You know, was there a, a pot of funding from 
you know, the leadership team in terms of making this happen? And if there were any kind of tips in regards to that from your own experience? Yeah, good, good question. So I think there, there wasn't any, there wasn't kind of any, uh, any funding at all. And I think that's why, that's kind of why I wanted to emphasize the fact that this was a, it was, this has been years in the making, um, because I think, um, in, or, in order to find the time to be able to research and create those resources, it has taken, it's taken us, you know, sort of years to, to embed that across the curriculum. Um, and I think that there are, there are definitely some great uh, resources out there. So there's a great website called Meanwhile Elsewhere, um, where they have, uh, they have sort of lists of sort of mainstream key stage three topics, and then they have worksheets about other things that were happening in the world at the same time. Uh, for, so for example, they have a, and I'm sure everyone teaches the Norman Conquest, and so they have a worksheet that parallels that about the Songhe Kingdom um, in West Africa. So there are there are resources out there already which are brilliant, which you can adapt. Um, but in terms of funding, there wasn't um, any. My dream is <laughs> my dream is to write a textbook. Um, is to put all of the things that we've done and, and to write a textbook. Um, so yeah, if anyone wants to give me funding for that, that would be great. Um, but in terms of yeah, it, it was just years of long uh, time being spent after school just researching and. Um, writing these resources essentially. That's great. No, thank you, Shalina. And yeah, it definitely does sound, you know, as you mentioned, it's, it's a long term project rather than any quick, quick wins in that regards. But, yeah. Um, but yeah, no, no um, other specific questions at the moment, Shalina. So when you're um, ready, please do, please do carry on. Brilliant. Okay. So I know racial literacy is something that is on everyone's mind. Um, it's a kind of terminology that is being talked about a lot. And the reason why I'm bringing up racial literacy here is because I don't think as a school you can necessarily embark on a journey towards embedding diversity without engaging and in sort of engaging in, I suppose, and examining the racial literacy of your staff. Um, and I think it's really key to decolonizing the curriculum that work is done on um, on this. So it's it's diff it's difficult to think about how to start this. I've got some suggestions uh, for um, how how you can go about this. So I wanted to start here, which is news round, uh, which I know is probably familiar to uh, to lots of you. And the the reason why I wanted to start with news round is because news round have got videos about racial lit literacy, and they have done for a very long time. If you look at one of them, there's from 2019. And the point I want to make here, I suppose, is that news round have released several videos around key racial literacy terms. And as I was therefore in theory students are becoming more racially illiterate because of you know because of resources like this and so i think it's really imperative that staff are as well um and what i would say is is that there is no reason why you can't use these um videos with your staff um there was a brilliant video that was released a couple of days ago on bbc bite size um, with john amici where he talks about the difference between between what it means to not be racist and being anti-racist for example which was a fantastic video um that again could be used in a C in a CPD with staff. Um, so I wanted to start there and, and kind of show that I suppose this is why we have to talk about racial literacy because it's something that young people are engaging in, um, and so it's something that I suppose we need to uh, we need to think about. And I think again, it goes back to that idea that students know more than we more than we think they do. I think um, so. Yeah, I think it's important to 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 kind of acknowledge that. And of course, the running me report that I mentioned earlier has got a section on racial literacy. Um, and it, there are some points there that I've uh, that I've copied across. Um, so if you wanted to, uh, it might be an idea, for example, to present that to staff and get them to read that before they come to a C, uh, to a series of CPDs, for example, about racial literacy to show that there's been a lot of research that's gone into this um, so I definitely recommend sharing that with staff um, so what can how could you how can you go about kind of tackling uh, and sort of analyzing I suppose how, what the racial literacy levels are of your staff so I've got some suggestions here which is um, these uh, definition these words have come from racial uh, equity tools.org it's on your um, resource list so I've picked um, eight words um, that I th and, the, and the reason why I've picked these eight is because these words, I think, are relevant to staff and students within a school setting. So I'll just give you uh, 10 seconds or so just to go through those words now and think, right, do you understand what those words mean? And what about your staff? Do you, do you feel confident that your staff would potentially be able to explain um, what these words are? Um, and I've got some definitions. Here. Again, these are not definitive definitions. These are just definitions that I think uh, that work with within the realm of what we're 
uh, with what we're talking about. Um, so if I take the second one, colorism, uh, you will notice there was a video from Newsround about colorism. And on the uh, on the website for Newsround, um, if you go onto the colorism video, and I want to read out what it says. It says, and remember that this is a, this is aiming at young people. It says, if you're black or Asian, then you might be familiar with other black or Asian people making comments on how light skinned or dark skinned you are. And the reason why I wanted to read that out is because some of our students will be familiar with colorism even if they don't know the word colorism um because they will have had comments made to them by their friends and family about their skin tone um since they were born potentially um and so it's really really important for us to to understand what all of these things mean because our students will potentially some of our students will potentially have been affected by it um intersectionality a really really important one to understand for the curriculum in particular um you know like I've just said, uh, when I mentioned Queens of Sheba, for example, and misogynoir, thinking about the idea that at what points are is, are the story of women, for example, told in our curriculum, and what does what do students therefore take away about women um, from this particular subject area? Um, microaggressions has to be something that is talked about, um, and it's it's difficult because, of course. <laughs> People who experience microaggressions, uh, if we're talking about race, um, microaggressions in school will not necessarily, of course, want to want to talk about them. Um, there's lots of research out there about microaggressions, and it's genuine. It's generally considered that there are three forms of microaggressions: so micro assaults, micro insults, and micro invalidations. Um, there's a video link that I've put in the resource list from a BBC video um, about microaggressions in the workplace. Um, but I think if you are going to embark on Kind of a racial literacy journey i think thinking about ways that you can uh that you can find out about the microaggressions that might be taking place in your school um is worth thinking about i will come back to that um shortly um here we go oh sorry there's five words here. there's nine words actually so there's five words here um that i think are really really important when it comes to schools um and the kind of in education environment so let's go through a couple of these ones model minority i think is something that is it's an american it's american terminology um, usually referencing or it's in its origins referencing the asian american community um but it has relevance for school because i think sometimes students who students who belong to groups that are perceived to be model minorities Sometimes their assumptions can be made about them. Perhaps there's higher expectations of those students. Perhaps there are assumptions made that that student may not be involved in incidents, for example, because they belong to a certain group. Um, so yeah, I think the model minority myth is something that we need to that we need to consider um, when we're thinking about our students. Is are some students in certain ethnic groups are they considered to be model minorities versus other students from other groups? And what implications is that having? Um, for their interactions with staff, for how they're perceived, etc. Um, I'm going to move on to the last one, um, white privilege, because I think it's something that you feel that like people feel uncomfortable about, but we've got to talk about it. Um, and so I've got a few ways um, and suggestions for how um, you can sort of start to educate staff about white privilege. Um, and so let's let's start with that. So I'm not sure how many of you have seen uh, the white privilege test. Um, this is um, an, this is an adapted version of it. So this is a 26 question version of it, which has been adapted for a British audience because originally uh, the research, um, which is by Peggy McIntosh called Unpacking the Knapsack, which is again in your resource list, which is fantastic. I would really recommend reading it about white privilege. Um, it's been, it, she's, it, this, the questions that she originally came up with um, were sort of very based within a kind of American uh, sort of terminology. So I really like this test because um, it frames everything within a British context. So uh, I'm sure a lot of you have been reading through uh, through this already. We've, we're going to be running out of time, so I don't want people to... I, what I was going to get you to do was actually to get a result for yourself out of 26. Um, because if you answer, if you answer more than 13, um, out of these uh, out of these statements, then you are considered to have um, to have white privilege essentially. Um, and so this is a really really powerful thing that you can do with staff. Um, and we have done this with all of our staff at Claremont, um, and it has sparked the most interesting conversations. And I think what we have to remember is is that staff have different under, have are on completely different journeys about this. Some staff will not be aware of the notion of white privilege potentially, whereas some staff will be consuming lots of uh, will be hyper aware of it will have been reading lots of 
lots of literature about it. So I think in order to sort of get everyone on the same basic page, this is a great place to start, I suppose. And the other thing is this, we had, I had lots of questions about how do we, as, as schools, how do we support our staff in becoming more racially lit literate? And for me, I think, it, like with anything, if you want to learn more about something, then it starts with reading and it starts with, um, with you know, hearing from people's, uh, people who have been researching and have experienced um, various things relating to this. And there are lots and lots and lots of books out there. I've got, there's, there's, there's so many that I own that are not um, even on this list. I've got one here, um, White Privilege, The Myth of a Post-Racial Society, um, which has got a chapter about schools actually, which is really good. But I picked these, um, these ones here. And the reason why I picked these is because these are all by British authors. And the reason why I picked British authors is because, partly because of the naysayers, because you might get some people in school who um, are not interested um, not that they're not interested, but people who are sceptical or don't want to um, or, you know, don't have any interest, quote unquote, um, with thinking about racial lit uh, racial uh, literacy. And I think by providing staff with them um, with American authors, I think sometimes that can maybe maybe that has a tendency to for people to, you know, to, for people to say that classic thing of which I don't agree with at all, which is oh, racism is so much worse in America, etc. And, you know, all that kind of nonsense. I think by providing staff with British authors to uh, to work with, I think it just it sort of cuts out um, any of those sort of arguments, I think. Um, and there are some different ways that you can that you can use this, I think. So, for example, something that I have done um, is I've provided extracts from some of these books and given them uh, given them to people to take away to read. And what I've asked them to do is I've asked them to PMI. So I've asked them to plus uh, to, to kind of jot down anything uh, that they thought was 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 a good thing, plus minus and also anything that they found interesting. And then we've had sort of roundtable discussions um, about this discussions within department meetings, for example, and PMI is, a, is kind of a non-threatening way, I think, of getting people to engage in reading. So that is a suggestion that I would have. Um, also asking people, you know, reading this extract, what implications does this have for our school um, in terms of staff, in terms of students, in terms of the wider community? Um, starting a book club, also using these with students as well. I have photocopied chapters from The Good Immigrant, for example, for my form, who are in year 12. We've had amazing discussions um, about those as well. Um, having a library for, uh, for staff as well. So um, I have uh, managed to get some money to buy a lot of these books over the last couple of years for our library that's in the staff room. People can take them out um, and read them as well. So I think engaging in British literature about this, I think is so important. Um, but like I said, you can't necessarily buy, I mean, me, if you have the budget to do it, do it. But I don't, I don't, I think it's unrealistic to say, get everyone to buy these books and read them. I think instead providing potentially extracts for people and then at least using that as a starting point, I think is a good, is a good, is a good thing to start. Um, also using powerful extracts as a discussion point, like I said, I've got three extracts here, which I won't read through, but three extracts here from René Edo Lodge, which I have used with staff uh, when talking about white privilege um, and um, this idea of I don't see colour and what how, what a problem that is. Uh, some of you might have noticed the, that photo of those two students there. Um, if you haven't seen The School That Tried to End Racism on Channel 4, I'd really recommend it. Um, I found it really, really interesting. The, the demographic of that school is very different to Claremont because this, that school had... 50% um, white students and 50% uh, BAME students, so different to my school. Um, but I found that really, found it really, really interesting, um, especially the way that the white students were talking exactly what René Edo Lodge says here, which is white children are taught not to see race, whereas children of colour are taught often with no explanation that we must work twice as hard as our white, white counterparts, etc. Um, so I'd really recommend watching um, that documentary, uh, why uh, the school that tried to end racism, because it delves into some really interesting um, some really interesting ideas there and again we've got another quote here that again feel free to use these and the images with your staff i think they're really interesting um discussion points i think um so some other suggestions um creating a staff bias audit um engaging in race related dialogue um, i think that's really 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 important um compulsory cpd for where everyone is there from slt all the way down um there are some great um the tests that you can do as well the harvard implicit association test they've got loads and loads of different ones that you can do but also pupil voice is really important here um parents as well um staff surveys anonymous surveys perhaps where staff can disclose the microaggressions that they face um while still feeling safe 
in a, in a safe way where they don't feel like you know their potential progression in the school will be affected um so there are lots of ideas i'm happy to talk more about this um if you'd like to uh, discuss in the future as well but those are some ideas um we've got beyond the classroom next aziz do we have any questions on any of this or is everyone just feeling overwhelmed with no, no, there's, uh, thanks Lina. there's two really good points and i just apologize for the background noise there's um primary school children <laughs> playing outside. they were doing yoga earlier oh, um, I love it. <laughs> stay Shalina, uh, um, I think it's Jordan Crawford has a, uh, an interesting question have you been met with resistance from staff mm, in mm -hmm. school and yep. if so how have you tackled navigated around that yep. and then just Great kind of following, following on from that is also mm -hmm. have there been any backlash from parents mm -hmm. yep. um, particularly, yeah yeah so uh, yeah Great. Uh, teachers yeah. and parents Brilliant. Great. Really, really great questions. Thank you. Uh, right. So I'll talk about staff, first of all. So um, I'm not going to lie. Yes. Um, so um, and that's kind of where I'm coming from when I'm saying that, you know, uh, getting staff on board and using British authors, for example, is really, really important because I have had um, challenging conversations um, with staff, uh, you know, who come from the I don't see colour uh, camp, you know, and trying to and trying to break that down and explain. And I think that is why I think it's really, really key that everyone um, in school is involved in any kind of big conversations that you have about this. Um, and I think it does come down to, it's really, it can be really difficult because it can feel really, really frustrating when you have those kinds of conversations. Um, and as a person who rants a lot, I find it, do find it very, very difficult. And I think for me, it comes down to taking a step back and thinking, okay, you know, perhaps the, somebody who is from the I don't see colour camp, it's because that is the way they've been brought up, which a lot of us were, you know, as in obviously not me because I'm not, <laughs> not white, but as in, you know, a lot of people have been brought up um, with this notion of, you know, you, we don't see colour, we treat everyone equally. And you can see that in the Channel 4 programme. So I think for me, when I have found, found staff to be a little bit resistant to it, it's been about providing them with specific extracts from, uh, from different authors that I think, um, that I think, will kind of resonate with them. So for example, one of the extracts, which I haven't put on here actually, there's an extract from in Renée Odo Lodge's book, Why I'm No Longer We're Talking to White People About Race, where she has a section that goes through the journey of a black student in the British education system. Um, and that was, a, was an extract that I have shared um, with staff who have been a little bit resistant because I think really trying to show them the impact that all of this has on students, I found that that has been quite helpful. Um, and in terms of parents, I would say, we haven't had resistance from parents. They have been really, really, really supportive um, of um, of this entire journey. Um, and I will talk about something that I've done to engage parents actually um, in the next section. So we'll talk about that. Um, brilliant. Any other questions? Yeah, Shalina, if I mm. could, uh, Rebecca Anderson has an interesting question. I just wonder if I could bring Rebecca in to mm. ask. The Ooh, question yes. itself, Rebecca, if you can um, unmute oh. or control, yeah. if you press control D, you should be able to speak. I don't know if you're... There we go. Is that working? Hello. Hello. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was a... I think I posted the question at about the same time um, as the other ones, and so it does follow on kind of quite nicely, um, which, again, is, is sort of looking at um, if you're in an environment which is more politically or socially cautious, mm -hmm. um, you know, sort of... Um, looking at how you know what we're trying to do is is encourage especially older students to be engaged and yeah. to be active and yeah. to you know actually sort of um yeah to embrace activism mm -hmm. yes. um but um then people start talking about prevent <laughs> so i just wondered whether you'd got a comment on that <laughs> oh dear well do you know what we've not got enough time in in the world to discuss my feelings on prevent <laughs> um but what i would say is is that i think I think what we have to understand is that students students are young activists, whether we talk about it in school or not. And so surely the argument I think that to be made there is that surely we have a duty to make sure that our students are engaging in activism in a safe um, in a safe way, I would say, because I think that because I think that's the key thing. And it goes back to what I said before, which is about the echo chamber, which is that if we are, hopefully, if we are engaging our students in becoming critical thinkers so that when they are seeing certain things online, they are able to can think about the things that we've told them in school and to use that to critique potentially what they might be seeing um, and empowering them um, to be able to do that. I think that I think that's the argument that I would make if they, if prevent is being used there as a as a as a wall to say we shouldn't be talking to students about this i would say actually it's all the more reason to talk to students about it if that makes sense 
Any other questions? Uh, just to pick up one quickly mm. from Faye here, which yes. is I'm um, just asking about if you know uh, if there are any re resources that you know about in terms of supporting young people who have autism or mm -hmm. um, SEMH pupils who may have low literacy and emotional levels. Great question. So I actually have, um, so part of my role in teaching and learning is that I have a team of teaching and learning leaders. Um, and one of my teaching and learning leaders um, is somebody who is an ex who's an, actually an expert in autism um, and working with SEND students. And what she does is she will, um, she will adapt some of the, some of the resources that we use to talk to, uh, to talk to students about this. And actually the next slide that I've got um, are resources for students um which could which kind of works really well with with uh, with that question actually um so i if i move on to the next bit and show you this slide here um which is that there are so many brilliant brilliant results and this is the tip of the iceberg there are so many brilliant resources out here that um here and just in in general out there um that are that can be used um with students um and as you can see from the slide it's really <laughs> they're, they're they're engaging they're really really they're sort of really colorful and um sort of inviting and what i would say is just that a lot of these books you might look at them and think well surely these are just for, for primary students but i would what i would say is is that you would be surprised about i have all these books in my classroom and it's it is <laughs> it surprises me so much how much even students in year 12 and year 13 will pick up, for example, stories for South Asian supergirls, which is aimed at sort of eight year olds um, and just flip through and just and because they want to, you know, because they, they're interested in learning about as many different people as they can. So these are just a few of the suggestions that I've got. And in terms of how you can engage students in those, um, using them in tutorials and registrations, um, for example, uh, to uh, to showcase some of these uh, some of this work and to talk to students about it. Starting a book club as well, um, asking students to write book reviews, uh, which we which is what we do in school. Um, and again, I think it relates to students becoming critical thinkers um, and asking them to sort of research more um, to create presentations about some of about some of this work. Um, and I think in relation to the question that we had about activism um, and, and things like that, I think the books that are at the bottom of the list, um, so Feminists Don't Wear Pink and Other Lies, Slay in Your Lane and I Will Not Be Erased, those books are great resources for those older students who are engaged in activism. And these books like this tell sort of, I suppose, they help students on, on that journey to become activists in a safe way. Um, and productive way. Um, so I would definitely recommend um, those three books, for example. Um, there was another one on the previous side that I had called Taking Up Space, which is another great one to use. So there are lots of resources out there um, that have been written specifically for this kind of emerging, these sort of emerging young activists um, that, we, that we're lucky enough to have in our schools now. Um, so those are, those, those are definitely resources that I would suggest. Um, I've got another set here of resources um, specifically about um, LGBT plus um, issues and the one by Sean Delancey they're called Celebrating Difference I would really recommend that you get because it's fantastic it's got case studies in there teaching ideas practical strategies research insights it's just brilliant so I'd really really recommend that but of course there are lots of others as well um, this slide I wanted to show you because this was this one of the slides that I presented to staff on the first day back in September last year and the reason why I wanted to show you this is because like I keep saying, <laughs> this is an ongoing process. You will never have done diversity and that's it. Um, there are stories every single day that are worth celebrating. And I'm not suggesting that you have a daily, I mean, that would be great if you had time to do that kind of a daily, uh, a daily sort of newsreel for, for students. But what I'm saying is, is that there are so many stories out there that we should be celebrating and telling our students about. Um, and including, as you can see there, um, about alumni as well, um, that I think it's just worth maybe using something like this with staff to say, look, we welcome you sharing, you know, stories that you see that you want to share with, with all the students, you know, let us know. And I have that now, staff, staff will send me um, and send people in the team, you know, stories that they found that they are going to be talking about with their forms, for example. Um, so making that, make it clear that this is a ongoing process, I think is really, really important as well. Um, displays around the school. Um, the Lambeth, uh, the Lambeth research talks about um, using um, using displays as a way to celebrate, um, you know, cultural diversity, etc. So I've got some examples there. This is from these are from my uh, my classroom in the history corridor. Um, this is an insight into some of the things that we uh, that we have used uh, for Black History Month last year, um, which you can have a read over. 
Um, and we're getting to the we're getting to the we're getting to the end. So I did want to talk about this now, which is school assemblies. Um, and I've just actually written an article for Teach Secondary um, where <laughs> one of the quotes that they've put in bold in the article is put down that PowerPoint with Gandhi and Martin Luther King quotes. And I think if we all <laughs> I think you're, if you, I, I just think if you think school assembly, you do just think, right, it's that it's that quote about Martin Luther King again. And we need to step away. Let's step away and think about what, how can we really use that time where we have all those students in front of us? Although whether that happens in this new normal, I'm not sure, obviously. Um, but in theory, how can we use assembly time um, to really enrich um, the curriculum offer that we have for our students? And this is an image that I wanted to share because this is an image I used, I think, three or four years ago for my Remembrance Day assembly. And it is so powerful um, because it's showing you Indian troops um, praying um, outside the Shah Jahan Mosque in Woking. I'm not sure if there's anyone here from Woking, but this is from your local area. Um, and it's such a powerful picture because this is, I said they interrupt the psyche because when, potentially when students think about World War I in the way that it's taught in, in schools and through textbooks, they don't imagine images like this. Um, and so using assembly time to showcase um, images like this are really, really important. Um, and I talked about VE Day earlier, and the reason why I got so many messages from students about the VE Day coverage is because when I, uh, it was this was an online assembly, of course, because VE Day, uh, obviously, we were in quarantine. Um, part of my VE Day assembly was this slide, where I really wanted to showcase to the students that, you know, think let's think about all the people that contributed um, to World War, uh, to, to British victory in World War II. And I said in that assembly, uh, which I had lots of comments from staff about how powerful that was, that... I said something along the lines of, you know, if you look at this slide, this slide represents our school. You know, it, rep it represents the people that are in our school. And it's really important to remember that people that look like us contributed to victory in the war. And unfortunately, like a lot of my students commented, that was not reflected in the mainstream, uh, in sort of in the mainstream coverage of this. But I think you know making the, making stories like this really clear to our students is very, very important and using assembly time is key um and we had a great question about extracurricular activity extracurricular activities and, and engaging uh, students in that and so i wanted to as so i hadn't put this in my powerpoint originally actually but i wanted to add this in which is this is a picture from uh, the history department belgium trip last year today we were meant to be going to belgium uh, with our students actually which is very sad but i wanted to show you this because we do the battlefields trip with our year 10s um and on that battlefields trip we take our students to go and see the graves of Indian soldiers um, in the Great War. And it gives me goosebumps talking about it um, because it, I can't explain to you how powerful it is for our, for our students to see that. For students of all, um, of all, of all origins. Um, and we make it really clear to our students that, you know, when we are going to visit these battlefields, the soldiers that fell looked like all of them. Um, and what we asked our students to do is we asked them uh, to write a little note um, and to place it at a grave of their choice. And this is just an example um, of one of the of one of the uh, notes that was written. Um, so, yeah, I want to show you that to show that, you know, even in what might seem like a sort of very traditional uh, school trip, we endeavour to uh, make sure that our students are getting a really wide, um, wide picture of that. Um, coconuts and Oreos. Um, Assembly time, I think for sixth form is it's really important. And it was great we had a question about sixth form and about activism actually. Um, in the sixth form, we try to make sure uh, um, that our assemblies are really, really engaging and relevant to them as they embark on their journey as kind of adults. And one of the, and I do assemblies quite often um, in the sixth form. And one of the assemblies that I did was really personal and it was about my identity as a woman of, British woman of South Asian heritage. And I did an assembly all about my uh, my sort of pr issues with being called a coconut. Uh, for those of you that don't know, um, people of Indian origin will sometimes be called a coconut because they're brown on the outside, white on the inside, um, based on ridiculous notions like the way that I speak, for example. And I, I did an assembly where I broke down um, my thoughts on that and my identity. And I spoke to lots of students before it as well about, uh, I spoke to, for example, um, some black students who spoke to me about the fact that they are called, referred to as Oreos, for example, by, by fellow students. and. I can't tell you how the impact that that assembly had in terms of the conversations that I had with staff and students after that was amazing because of the fact, and this was a couple of years ago, um, because of the fact that students, they said to me that they'd never heard an adult talk about their identity in that way. Now, of course, 
it's because I feel comfortable talking about it. Um, and I please don't force staff to do this. Um, but I think if you do have staff who are willing to share, um, you know, their sort of journey in terms of what they think about their identity, I think it can be really, really, really powerful. And again, I had comments from parents um, about the fact that they had really interesting conversations with their, with their children um, after that. So that's an idea um, as well. Um, this map is from my classroom and you can't really see, but you can see that there, hopefully you can see there are red pins um, on the map and they represent the places where my year 10 students, where their families have come from. And um, what I asked them all to do is I asked them to interview their families. Um, I asked them to interview their families and to ask them um, how their families ended up living in, in Britain. And I said to them, if you feel comfortable, only if you feel comfortable. I gave them a green card and I said, if you'd like, and I said, you know, if you'd like to write down a summary of, the, of your family story and I'll put it up um, on the board. And they all, they all, I think all of them said that that was fine. So we did. And in the lesson that after I put the display up, I remember, because I almost cried, <laughs> because I said to them, um, can you stand, if you feel comfortable, can you stand up if your families have moved here partly as a result of escaping from war? And so many of our students stood up um, and it was, and I said to them all, like, look around the room now, because, and they were sort of amazed as well by, by that. And it was powerful for many, many reasons. I had comments from parents um, at parents' evening and also calls from parents saying, my child has never spoken to me about this journey um, and thanking me for that. I had a, a really powerful um, email from a, from a mother who said that her son interviewed, uh, interviewed his grandfather and she didn't actually realise that her grandfather had been um, beaten up by skinheads when he moved uh, to Britain um, um, in, the, in the kind of the Windrush generation. So and she said, you know, she just thanked me for saying I've never had that conversation with my own father. Um, and she wanted to thank me for it. So I think, you know, students don't necessarily talk to their parents about these issues and parents don't necessarily talk to their own parents or their children about it either so um, in terms of that question we had about what has parents reaction been to a lot of this work that it's been overwhelmingly positive because of the fact that we've sort of I suppose provided um, provided support for them to have these conversations with their students and that is why in this interview task I provided really specific questions for the students to, to ask and provided them with a format because I wanted the students to have these conversations in a sort of a safe and positive way um, rather than just going home and asking their parents and you know um, so that was just an example of something um, else that I've done as well um, so we are pretty much at the end now so um, just last few things which I suppose is this is not something that can be done over the holiday um, but those are some of the key things to sort of think about um, and actually that the one from the, the penultimate one relates to that the question that I had are, um, are you engaging with students and parents to help you on this journey as well um, there's a few other things as well, which is also reflecting on the four capitals, which is this is not something that one person can do in school. Um, I certainly, I suppose, am the face of this in school, but there are so it is it's something that is shared amongst amongst staff. And so thinking about actually on this journey, um, thinking about the four capitals um, in really interestingly, in the knowledge capital one we're there where it says identify those who have knowledge of effective school practice and capture it. Um, there's a really interesting section of the Runnymede report that talks about um, BAME staff and not assuming that just because um, you have a member of staff that is, say, like me, that is of South Asian heritage, that doesn't necessarily mean that I am racially literate. Um, which I and it's, it, it explains it really well in the Runnymede report. So I definitely uh, engage with that and think about that when you're thinking about who may have the knowledge and who doesn't. Um, and then the other thing is, is that after this, uh, you're probably feeling overwhelmed and want to do yoga like those kids in the playground are doing. Um, but in terms of an action plan, I think if it's going to work, it has to be embedded within your school action plan. Um, and it's got to be short, medium and long term as well. It, there could be things that you want to do by uh, September over the holiday, but then think medium and long term as well. Um, and I think that is pretty much it from me. So Aziz, should I not share my screen anymore? Yeah, that's great, Shalina. If you want to um, stop sharing your screen, okay. come I, will, I will attempt to seamlessly do that. Although, oh, here we go. You are presenting. Stop presenting. There thank, we go. You, thank you so much. That was fantastic. And I, I'm just going to give people an opportunity to post any last minute questions uh, in the chat. 
Um, I'm just quickly going to refer uh, just to our website and mm -hmm. just where a few of our resources and other bits can be found. And then I'll come back to if you bear me one second. OK, hopefully you can see my screen now. And I just wanted to flag that, um, as I mentioned, Shalina's excellent presentation has been recorded. And it will be hosted on our website and there's a few different areas that you can look through that's so obviously challengepartners.org and we have our members section you do need to log in to access this section if you don't have access you can uh, email me directly and i can set you up with an account but when you go onto our members area we have a range of different webinars we've mentioned our virtual leadership development sessions which is this is the eighth of uh, and there's a range of resources in there as well uh, please do also visit the event section of our website. Um, again, th there's a range of different events that um, there's more and further information on there. And you can find uh, a list of some of our previous uh, virtual leadership development sessions the, uh, and the recordings of those sessions. So please do check that out for any further information. And hopefully you have my contact details. You can contact me directly if you do need um, do you need any assistance or any guidance in terms of engaging with our network and accessing those those resources? So I just wanted to highlight that quickly. Um, I'll just come back to the chat. I know that people have been um, sending their thanks. Uh, just to go back, um, Shalina, Mark Henry had uh, an interesting question just around, I guess, how you deal with differences in terms of cultural appropriation or yeah, misinterpretation. I, yeah. I saw that question. I, I I really I wanted to answer it, so I'm glad you picked that one up. Actually, yeah, um, I, just to come back. Yeah, yeah. I think that's su that is such a good question. And again, cultural appropriation is something that I have spoken to. Um, I do sessions with sick form students actually about cultural appropriation and what it and what it means and the implications of it and things like that. And I think it's something again on this kind of racial literacy uh, journey. It's something that has to be part of that conversation about cultural appropriation because I think there is still so much awful obvious cultural appropriation that happens within amongst sort of celebrities and mainstream media etc that it, it feels like um it, it feels like you know there's still so much unlearning to do um and I think that's re I think that's really really important and so yeah I think what we have to remember I suppose is that it's like I said about the racial literacy journey in terms of I'm assuming that everyone here, all the people that are here listening now, you're all you're all engaged in, of course, reading about racial literacy, etc. But that is not necessarily the case with lots of staff. And so even though cultural appropriation is something that, like I said, I've been talking to students about for years and years and years, but it might be something that's totally alien um, to people, in which case they may not understand. They might there's there's often people often who misunderstand cultural appropriation think that it's cultural appreciation um, which is often not the case so it's really really important to break down what does cultural appropriation mean it's not appreciation um, and um, yeah and I think delving into delving into that I think is really really is, is really really important it was, it was a great question no, definitely. Thank, thank you, Shalina. And, I, and I'd just like to take this opportunity again to thank you so much and to just echo, you know, the feedback on the chat, which is thank you so much for giving your time to you know, talk about the fantastic work and share those excellent resources. Um, yeah, I'd just like to give a virtual round of applause <laughs> and I'm sure that everyone else will join me. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I just like to say that I, I know I have just, I've talked so much and so quickly about so many of those things. Normally that presentation was it was originally a three and a half hour training session that I've managed to somehow get through in, in an hour. So there's so much more that I have to say about all this. So please, if you want to talk more about it, then please get in touch. Um, yeah, I could talk about it all day. So. <laughs> No, thank you. And, and uh, you know, it was a very rich presentation. And I think just to flag, I will obviously be sharing uh, a copy of the slides around. And, and Sheena, I can also share your contact details if mm -hmm. they're not already embedded in the yeah. presentation. Uh, and yes, you and just a reminder, um, feedback forms will be shared as well. Uh, and please Great. do let me know if you have any follow up questions or anything at all. But um, thank you very much, everyone, for your presence today. And